good. Okay, well, welcome back to our class, Sacrifice of Christ, the Old and New Testaments. Uh, we do have a new pupil with us tonight. <laughs> I won't try to review the whole course, but <laughs> you know we've covered as best we could the five major sacrifices and how they point to Christ, and then the major types and prophecies in the Old Testament that point to the Christ's death. <laughs> Last week we looked at Matthew and Mark, uh, covered quite a bit of material there. And today we want to look at Luke's Gospel, primarily chapter 23, but we'll look at the end of chapter 22 to begin. Luke, being a physician, he made note of a few things that the other Gospels didn't. Specifically, the sweat drops of blood. And that's where we will begin uh, in Luke chapter 22, verses, verse 41. Here Christ was with the certain disciples in the garden, and it says in verse 41, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He said this instance of the sweat, as it were, of great drops of blood falling to the ground is not recorded in the other Gospels. But it thought it interesting that it, John specifically tells us that it was cold that night. The other gospels tell us that there was a fire built and Peter warmed his hands by the fire. But even though it was cold that night, he was in such agony, if you will, that he was sweating. And it says here is that he was sweating these great drops of blood. And this is a medical condition perhaps our nurses in the audience could elaborate more but if I'm saying this right it's called hematidorsis or tidrosis it's a condition in which the blood vessels that feed sweat glands rupture and they exude blood from them and it usually occurs under extreme physical or emotional stress I certainly Christ was under a great deal of lack of a better word emotional stress in this as he was praying here in the garden I know the, the physical aspect was going to be rough enough as it was but the, the spiritual aspect of being separated from the father of being the whole weight of sin being upon him Certainly, it was an overwhelming thought, I guess you could say. Right. During this condition, it said blood usually oozes from the forehead, the nails, the belly button, and other skin surfaces. You know, it weakens the body. It causes mild to moderate dehydration. It says even though the blood loss is generally minimal, it says... That results in the skin becoming extremely tender and fragile. We know he was later beaten. So with the skin being extra tender, he probably bled even easier. Probably the suffering was even greater with it. If he prayed here, not my will, but thine be done. Because he asked, if I will be willing to remove this cup from me, I don't think Christ didn't want to accomplish redemption, but the flesh perhaps thought maybe there's another way we can do this. But notice the response from God was that there, he sent an angel to him, strengthening him in verse 43. God will always give strength when strength is needed. And in this, he completely submitted himself 
to what God would have him to do. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And that ought to be our prayer just the same. Let's go on to down to verse 47 here. Here it says, And while he yet spake, you know, he had rose from his prayer and found his disciples sleeping. He was talking to them, and he says, While he yet spake, behold, a multitude. And he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. So here we see the betrayal, as we saw last week. Uh, but Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Here we see something different that we didn't see last week. In verse 49, it says, When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? Verse 50 says, And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. We know this was Peter. John tells us this. But it's... In Matthew, Mark, it doesn't record that them asking the question, but I imagine it probably went something like, you know, the other disciples, Matthew, uh, Nathaniel, all those, uh, James and John, probably saying, Lord, shall we is there smite with the sword? And Peter was probably already had it raised up, ready to go. Peter was quick to jump at things a lot of times. But Jesus answered in verse 51 and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. You know, I imagine there was a bit of blood loss there for the servant. <laughs> Had his ear cut off, and yet Christ just picks it up and sticks it right back on like it was nothing. You know, almost like a Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> well, I imagine he could... He stuck it back on there and he could hear just as well as ever, if not better. Right. Christ oftentimes has to come to our, our rescue, doesn't he? To fix our mess ups. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't that his disciples should fight for him, it was his time to be delivered. As he'll, we'll see in the next couple of verses here, let's go on to 52. It says, Then said Jesus unto the the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves verse 53 says when I was daily with you in the temple ye stretched forth no hands against me but this is your hour and the power of darkness they had in the eyes of man at least plenty of opportunity to arrest Christ they at other times sought to arrest him and stone him. But yet, the hour wasn't yet, was it? Not until now. He says, now is your hour, the power of darkness. So John 7.30, among other places, they sought to take him, but they couldn't. They says his hour had not yet come. Many times they would seek to take him and yet he would slip out some right. through the back door or something but now his hour was come now was the time he was to be offered up and it didn't matter if Peter and all the other disciples that fought against him he was going to be delivered up verse 54 says then they or then took they him and led him and brought him unto the high priest house and Peter followed afar off this is, you know, as we saw in the other gospels as well that they took him. They took him to uh, Caiaphas's house, and when it says Peter followed from off from a distance, he, you know, the next eight verses tell of Peter's denial. You know, he said, "I know not the man. I know not the man. Man, I don't know what you're talking about." He, It said that his speech betrayeth him. He, they could tell he was a Galilean, just like Christ and the rest of the disciples. That will be a something to remember when we get a little bit farther down the chapter here. 
I want to go on to skip down to verse 63. Now we find Christ has been arrested, and he's at Caiaphas's house here. And it says, And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? And many other things blasphemously spake they against him. Here we see they they beat him. They covered his face up and smote him and said, "You know who's it? Who's hitting you?" Right. Just as another way to mock him again. And all this fulfill is fulfilling Isaiah and Psalms 22. Right. You know, and many other things that blasphemously spake they against him. I'm sure they mocked probably every aspect of his being. Perhaps deride him as being just a wicked and sinful man. You know, I and yet the other gospels tell us that Christ just willingly submitted to this. He was didn't answer them a thing. I'd say most of us in our flesh would want to rise up and right. rebel against that, or we try to defend ourselves, but yet. Christ willingly went as a lamb to the slaughter. Yeah. Let's go on to the next verse here, verse 66. It says, And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, or, and if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Well, it appears that this was a different trial than Matthew and Mark records, because Matthew and Mark say that it happened before the day. I, most people, or most of the commentaries, think that there was some sort of informal trial, and then as the morning arose, there was an official, if you could say that, trial. Christ's answers are slightly different here as well. And they said, Art thou the Christ? And he says, If I tell you, you will not believe me. He could have said, Yeah, I'm the Christ, but yet we know they wouldn't have believed him. Right. Just as I mentioned, he could have came down off the cross when they said, You know, if thou be the Christ, save thyself, and yet they still wouldn't have believed him. You know, when he was casting out devils, and they said he had a devil, or he was the devil. The Jews were, at least these particular Jews, were not a people of faith. Right. Well, they could have been shown and, and told as plain as day, and yet they would not have believed. He said, if I, ask, if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. Well, if he, if he says if he was asked them who he was, they wouldn't have said that he was the Christ, nor would they have let him go. So it really didn't matter how he answered they were going to say he was wrong. He was. They were going to say he was guilty. Right. In verse 69, we see the same proclamation as we saw before, that he would be sitting on the right hand of the power of God. And we know that it is his place even now. Stephen testifies of that in his stoning, that he saw the Son of Man standing in the right hand of God. Verse 70 says, Then said they all, Art thou the Son of God? Or art thou then the Son of God? And he said unto them, Ye say that I am. And he basically said, well, Yeah, you said it. You know, we might say, You betcha nowadays. <laughs> they didn't like that too much, did they? If you remember in Matthew and Mark's trial the high priest rent his clothes and got angry at him which was as I show, showed was against the law so the high priest was guilty of sin as he's accusing Christ of sin and they said in verse 71 what need we any further witness for we ourselves heard of his own mouth and he said well we don't need any more witnesses we've got him here we got him 
as good as guilty. You know, as I pointed out last week, for blasphemy, the law required stoning. And yet, for reasons we could speculate, they took him to the Romans instead. Right. Let's go on to the leave chapter 23 now. Here they bring him before Pilate. In verse 1 it says, And the whole multitude of them rose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the king. Well, here they make some very blatant false accusations. We don't see this in the other Gospels, but it says here that they accused him of forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. Now, that was obviously against what Christ himself had taught. Right. Uh, Matthew twenty two twenty one and Mark twelve seventeen, where he said, Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Right. You know, the last part was true, that he himself was Christ the king. But that didn't mean that he was trying to overthrow Caesar. Right. You know, his kingdom was not of this world. The Jews, they were looking for that a king to come and take back the kingdom, of, to set up rule in Jerusalem. And one day, certainly Christ will rule in that sense, I believe. But yet, that was not what he came to do the first time. Caesar's rule was not in was not threatened by Christ, and he certainly didn't say that. Don't give tribute to Caesar. Verse 3 it says, And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. You, as we saw before, basically, yep, you said it. Yep, that's me. And certainly he was king of the Jews. And really, in a sense, he still is king of the Jews. He's the king of all kings. Verse 4 says, Then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. As was expected, as he he was the lamb without spot, without blemish. As was required by the law, it would be a perfect sacrifice. Right. The Jews, they can only make false accusations against him because they couldn't find any fault in him themselves. Even Pilate says, I find no fault in this man. Verse 5 says, and they were the more fierce, saying, He stirred up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, or all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. So they're saying they were more of the fierce, it says. They were even more persistent. Saying, no, he stirs up the people. He's. It's kind of ironic that they're basically accusing him of stirring up a riot, and then they later on request to have a rioter released unto them. You know, it says he... T teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. You know, Christ's ministry does begin to Galilee. That's the first place we find him, and where he spends most of his time. You know, Mark 1, 9, Acts 10, 38, both testify that he was first found in Galilee, specifically Nazareth. And he, come when he came to John to be baptized. Like I said, remember, the accusation against Peter was that he was one of the disciples because he was a Galilean. Most of the disciples, perhaps all of them, I don't recall, were Galileans. You know, and, uh, it seems that the Jews in Jerusalem kind of looked down upon them as not being quite as good as they were. Uh, Luke 13, 1 and 2 tell us about a time when Pilate mingled the blood of Galileans with their sacrifices. He said, Suppose ye that these were sinners above the rest? He said, I tell you nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Right. You know, Acts 5.37 is mentioned a specific Galilean named Judas that rose up a rebellion. For whatever reason, the Galileans were seemed to be looked down upon by many of the other Jews. He began from 
from Galilee to this place. So throughout all of Judea, Christ had perverted the people, they said. He stirred them up. He had, and yeah, in a sense, he had stirred up the people, but not against Caesar, not against the government, but he had stirred them up against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the hypocrites. He had stirred up a people that under salvation, but not under rebellion. Go on to verse 6 here. It says, When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to the Herod jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at this time. Now, he was a Galilean. The fact that he was raised in Nazareth. John seven forty one tells us very plainly that he was from Galilee. We know that he was born in Bethlehem, spent some time in Egypt. Then he finds Joseph and Mary find their way to Nazareth, and that's where he spends his childhood, and I'm sure the early part of his adulthood as well. But Pilate, being the type of person he was, he saw the first opportunity he could get rid of Jesus and send him on to Herod. I, Pilate was one to pass the book if he could. He basically said, no, it's not my jurisdiction here. To, which according to Luke 3, 1, it was, Herod was over Galilee and Pilate was over Judea in the south. Now this Herod is not Herod the Great that had the children two and under killed in Bethlehem. You know, that Herod passed away and his son Herod Antipas took over. This is the same Herod though that beheaded John the Baptist. It's supposed that he was a Jew, a proselyte Jew at least. His, he was of Edomite lineage. So he was no doubt probably here in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. You know, being a quote unquote good Jew. Verse 8 says, though, and when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. It's almost as if Herod thought he was some sort of jester to entertain him. You know, Here, show me some miracle. Uh, one thing I didn't notice until I was studying this out that Back in Luke chapter 9, uh, verses 7 through 9 specifically, after John the Baptist had been beheaded, the people were saying that Christ was John the Baptist resurrected. And Herod marveled and it said he desired to see him. So all the way from chapter 9 to here in chapter 23, Herod had been desiring to see Christ. Right. And I'm sure was thinking, well, this is a sight to see. He's been resurrected even though I cut his head off. He was desirous to see him for a long season, it says, because he had heard many things of him and had hoped, and he had hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. You know, Herod was like the typical Jew. He needed to see something, didn't he? He wasn't one that lived by faith. Right. The Jews require a sign, Paul said. Verse 9 says, Then he questioned with many or questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. I'm sure Herod was asking him a lot of questions, and yet Christ answered him nothing. Christ just sat there silently. As a lamb that is dumb was led to the slaughter. Right. I know I repeat that phrase a lot, but that's the wording of Isaiah and Isaiah 53. And it's repeated a couple times in that particular passage as well. Verse 10 says, And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. They in, vehemently means they intensely or fiercely accused him. They, they didn't just say, yeah, he, he's done this and that. They were very adamant at accusing him. They didn't like Christ and what he stood for. And... They had done determined they were going to put him to death however they could. 
as they were good at, they falsely accused him over and over again. Yet we see Christ just willingly submitting himself to the the false accusations, the mockings, the beatings that would come along with it. Verse number 11, it says, And when Herod with his men of war set him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate. Here we see, once again, he's mocked, and specifically mocking his kingship by putting this robe upon him. And it says they sent him again to Pilate. So you know, Herod couldn't find anything wrong with him. They couldn't find any fault with him. But yet, so he said, I'm going to send you back to Pilate. Verse 12, it says, In the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. You know, I, I made a note here. Sarcastically, I'm so glad that they could unite once again against Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Hatred for God and his people seems often to unite the wicked. Right. There's really nothing in the scriptures that tell us exactly why Pilate and Herod were at enmity with one another. Some suppose that that passage in Luke that I mentioned in chapter 13 where Pilate killed some Galileans that maybe that caused the problems between them because Galilee was in Herod's district and not Pilate's. But whichever, for whatever reason they were had been enemies and now they were friends because of this instance with Christ. It says in verse 13 of Pilate when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said unto them he brought this man unto me as one that perverted the people and behold I have behold I having examined him before you have found no fault in this man touching those things whereof ye accuse him no nor yet Herod for I sent you to him and lo nothing worthy of death is done unto him here we see once again Pilate says I can't find anything wrong with him I can't find anything that he has done against the law it's because Christ was the perfect Lamb of God right. without spot and without blemish he hadn't done anything even against the law of the Romans nor against the law of God let's go to verse uh, 16 it says for I will therefore chastise him and release him I don't know if he I guess he thought this would satisfy the Jews you know I'll I'll chastise him, I'll, I'll beat him, and give him back to you. Verse 17 says, For of necessity he must release, unto them, or release one unto them at the feast. As we know, it was the custom of the people to have a prisoner released to him at, at the very least a Passover. So Pilate thought he could kill two birds with one stone here, I guess. He'll release a prisoner unto him, that is Christ, and beat him so that the Jews will be happy and leave him alone. So Pilate was off, was always looking for the easy way out, it seems like. Mm -hmm. He didn't seem like he really, really wanted to put Christ to death, but he didn't really want to release him if he didn't have to either. You know, he was going to do whatever necessary to make it easy on himself. Verse 18 says, And they, they, speaking of the Jews, cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. And we mentioned this Barabbas last week and how that he was an insurrectionist, a rioter, an insurgent, if you will. And, and sometime during this sedition, he had killed a man. And John tells us he was also a robber, so no doubt he was you know, rioting and plundering, stealing stuff, and at least killing one person along the way. Right. And this was the person they desired over Christ. Like I said, they, but they were just accusing Christ of you know, stirring up the people, and that's exactly who they had released unto them, was one who rioted against the people, or rioted against the, the government, if you will, 
pilot as or not pilot uh, Bravis would be a model citizen for the Democrats today. Right. <laughs> anyway, that's a different subject for another time. Verse 20, we'll go on and says, Pilate therefore willing to release Jesus spake again to them. See, it seems that he says he was willing to release Jesus, but he wasn't really making a stand for Christ, was he? If he could, he would release Christ, but if he didn't, if he couldn't, then he wasn't too worried about it. Verse 21 says, But they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And as I've often said, I think even if Christ were to come today, people would, maybe they wouldn't cry out, crucify him, but they would want to put him to death. Yep. Verse 22, and it says, and, they, and he said unto them the third time, Why, what evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. Pilate does one last time to say, Well, I haven't found any fault in him. I found no cause of death in him, nothing worthy to be put to death. And I'll chastise him, I'll give him a good beating, and then let him go. But notice verse 23, it says, And they were instant with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. They, I think uh, one of the other gospels says, And they cried out the more, Crucify him, crucify him. The mob rule doesn't always get the get it right, does it? It's usually not the right way. In verse in the end of verse twenty three tells us that the mob rule got its way though, and the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. You know, the who those who shout the loudest usually win. Right. That doesn't mean justice was served, doesn't mean the right thing has been done. We could get off on politics and how that applies even to our country today, but you can be sure that just because the majority cries out something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Just because the, the people want it that way doesn't necessarily mean it's God's way to be done, if I could say it that way. Certainly it was the will of God that Christ would be delivered up and crucified, but these Jews here, they were very much responsible for sentencing Christ to death. Let's go on to verse 24. It says, And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And he released unto them him that first sedition that is Barabbas, and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. The other Gospels tell us that Pilate himself beat Christ before he released him. He, Pilate was a man pleaser, if you will. He was not really willing to stand for principle. He just gave in to the will of the people. You know, when he when he saw that he couldn't prevail against them, he said, "Well, okay, well you can have your way." Verse twenty six says, "And they." Or as they led him away, they laid upon laid hold upon one Simon a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. So here we see as before they compelled Simon the Cyrenian to bear the cross, because at this point Christ was too weak, mm -hmm. too physically drained, if you will, to even bear the cross himself. Between all the beatings he took and Finally, the beating there by Pilate, I'm sure he was probably to the point of giving out, physically speaking. Right. Verse 27 says, And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. Now, I'm not sure that the great company of people here were grieving over him, but certainly the women here were. You know, I think we would grieve if we considered how that our sin put him on the cross, though, wouldn't we? How that God himself had to die for our sin ought to be a grievous thought to us. Right. 
and yet the Jew, the disciples were nowhere to be found still. They were following a great way off, I think it says later on. Right. Here in the next few verses, going to verse 28, Luke records some dialogue that's not recorded in the other Gospels. Verse 28 through 31 here, it says, But Jesus turned unto them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. He tells them, Don't weep for me. Christ knew that he would be victorious over the cross. He says, Weep for yourselves and for your children. No doubt Christ knew of the judgment that was coming upon the people. No doubt he knew of the by and large number of people who would be eternally damned to hell because they would not believe on him. He says, Don't weep for yourselves and for your children or weep for yourselves and for your children. He goes on to tell of the judgment that would come upon them in verse twenty nine, for behold, as the days are coming in that the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Well, that seems to be the right. described the attitude of many today, doesn't it? But yeah. I'm not sure that that's exactly the meaning that Christ meant here, but it seems that if the day was coming that things would be so bad that you would be glad that you didn't have children to suffer. Yeah. That you didn't have to see your children starving to death or being killed in war. and In that sense, it would be a good thing. But but today it's seems to be the attitude that yeah if you can't have children if you don't have it's here blessed are the barren the wombs that never bear and the past which never gave suck that seems to be a positive thing today. Right. But that's really the judgment of God upon the people. Right. Verse thirty he continues on and says then shall they begin to say to the mountains fall on us and to the hills cover us. You know, this seems to be a direct re- reference to Hosea chapter 10 verse 8 and as well as Revelation chapter 6 verses 15 through 17. Both of those echo the same words here. They would cry into the mountains and the hills to fall on us and cover us. In Revelation it adds that for the great day of his wrath is coming who shall be able to stand? When the wrath of God comes upon this world, no one will be able to stand against him. Right. We won't get into eschatology. Maybe Brother Kenny could explain that better to us. That's not my area of expertise. But verse 31 tells us, For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall they, what shall be done in the dry? You know, I always wanted to preach a sermon on this verse, but the Lord never led it to me. But a green tree, it's a fresh tree. Isn't it? A wet tree. You know, any of you that have cut or burned firewood, you know a green tree doesn't burn quite as good as a, a dry tree or a seasoned tree because it's still got a lot of water in it and sap as well. But I think what Christ is saying here is, you know, if they're so f- full of wickedness, they do such wickedness when Christ Himself is in their midst. You know, how much more so will they when Christ has been gone for some time? We see 2,000 approximately years have passed since Christ has been here. And I don't think men have got more wicked, but certainly wickedness abounds more and more. Right. You know, man is wicked from his youth, but wickedness seems to be accepted more and more in our societies. And it seems that the things which God has called good are now becoming be called evil right. you know, I don't know that we're quite to the days of Sodom and Gomorrah yet that level of wickedness but we're not too far off from it you know but the I think brother Adam taught a class not that long ago about the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah and the thing was, they were just continuing on life as nothing had, as if God didn't even exist. 
Well, one day Christ is coming again, and we ought to be looking for that day. Anyway. He says, if, these, if they do these things in the green tree, what shall they do in the dry? And if they did these things to Christ himself, we should not expect better treatment from the world. You know, if they, they crucified our very Lord and Savior, and yet we expect to just get along and hold hands with everybody. And that's not necessarily the way of the Christian. We'll continue on here. Verse 32. And there were also two other male factors led with him to be put to death. These were the two thieves, as the other Gospels tell us. They were be crucified, one on his left and one on his right. Verse 33 says, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, they were crucified, and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And this word Calvary here is different in Luke than the other Gospels. The other Gospels tell us it was called Golgotha in the Hebrew. For those of you who may be interested, the Greek word here is a uh, cranion. I might be saying that wrong, but that's where we get our word cranium from. Just simply means skull. And Calvary comes from the Latin word for skull, which is Calvaria. So it's cranion to Calvaria to Calvary in English. All meaning the skull or the place of the skull, as it's called. For whatever reason we prefer Calvary, maybe it sounds a little better than Golgotha. But they were at this place, the place of the skull, Calvary, Golgotha, and they crucified him there with the other two thieves. And we know in this, Isaiah 53, 12 was fulfilled when he said he shall be numbered with the transgressors. Verse 34, we see the, the first words of Christ upon the cross. It says, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. And they part his garments and cast lots. And the last part of that verse is a fulfillment of Psalms 22, 18, where they part his garments and cast lots upon his vesture. I, I preached a whole, whole sermon on this prayer of Christ, so we won't get too in-depth in it, but when doing this, he prayed for the transgressors. Or he made intercession for the transgressors, as Isaiah says. In this, he fulfilled his own command to pray for his enemies. In this, we see Christ had compassion even in the, even while he's being crucified. We should act just the same, shouldn't we? In the midst of persecution or tribulations, we should be a compassionate people. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I had to say that Christ's prayer had to be answered. His prayers were always in harmony with God the Father. I don't know if they were forgiven just of this one sin. I know some that were in this multitude were would later be saved in the book of Acts. But nevertheless, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, which is very similar to Stephen's prayer when he was being stoned. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. But really, we see a, a model, if you will, an example that we ought to follow. Verse 35, it says, And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. Again, fulfilling the Psalms 22, verses 7 and 8, where it says that he trusted in God. You know, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God, he says here. You know, they say, well, he trusts in God, let's see if God will save him. You know, God would deliver him, just not in the way that the Jews and the soldiers thought he would. Verse 36 says, And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. Here we see the offering of vinegar, which 
The other gospels say that he'd taste it, but he would not drink. Probably because there was myrrh mixed in with it, which would have perhaps lessened his pain. Myrrh was often used as a pain reliever and antiseptic in that time. They mocked him once again. Over and over again, he was mocked. You know, he, as I mentioned, he had the the power, if you will, to to save himself or take himself down from the cross. But I don't, I don't know the right word for it. But he couldn't do it because the scriptures had to be fulfilled. Because he had to fulfill the will of, and purpose of God. Right. But certainly, he had the power to be able to do that. If, Back in the garden, I believe it was, he said he could call 12 legions of angels to deliver him. I'm sure if we, in our sinful nature, if we had the power to call 12 legions of angels, we'd have called them down. Yes, brother. If I know we're all we're talking hypothetical here, but all those legions of angels could have wiped out the whole nation of Israel. Really, in his godness, his godhood, he could have spoke and just took it all out. But we know he had to fulfill the scripture. We know he had to, he had submitted himself perfectly to the will of God, and he had to accomplish redemption's plan here. Like I said, the only word I can know I think is he didn't have the ability because he would have went against his own word. He would have made the scriptures not be fulfilled. But I'm sure there's a better word or to describe it. It's, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. That's always the temptation of Satan, isn't it? If you know, some have suggested that Satan came unto him there in the garden and tempted him. Because if you go back to Luke chapter 4, it said Satan departed him for a season. But we know Satan no doubt came and in some sort of way tempted him some other time. I'm sure Satan, I don't know what was going through the mind of Satan while Christ was on the cross, if he thought he was defeating Christ or if he thought he was going to be defeated himself. Because it was through death that Christ defeated Satan. I think it's Hebrews that tells us that through the death he defeated the one who had the power of death, that is the devil. Anyway, let's go on to verse 38 here. So then a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. As we saw in Matthew last week, it says this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. So perhaps uh, Luke didn't see the whole subscription here, but nevertheless it bears the same message that Christ was the king of the Jews. And we... No, here was written in Greek, which was the common language of the land at that time, and Latin, which was the language of the Romans, and Hebrew, which was obviously the original language of the Jews. You know, there was none that would not see this and be able to understand what was written. Right. And my personal thought is that the one of the thieves saw it and understood what was written. In fact, we'll go on to verse 39. It says, And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. You know, one of the thieves there, they he was mocking Christ. You know, I think it's one of the other 
Gospels of Matthew, it says that both of them at one point were mocking him. But at this particular instance, just the one was and saying, you know, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. He, he was looking to get something out of it, wasn't he? His, cry, his mocking was different. He didn't say just, if thou be the Christ, save thyself. He said, say, you know, while you're saving yourself, save us too. That's always the, ten, you know, the inclination of the flesh to get something from God, to get something from Christ. To see what we can profit from it. Verse 40 says, But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Certainly the other one must not have feared God, that he was mocking the Lord's Christ. That he was mocking Jesus, the Savior of the world. Seeing thou art in the same condemnation. See, he was sentenced to die just the same as Christ was, and yet he was, he was mocking him. The difference was Christ was not guilty of anything of death, and yet the thieves were. As the other thief would testify in verse 41, he says, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. You know, these verses are often called the conversion of the thief. And certainly we see his salvation here. The first part being that he you know, he recognized that he was guilty. That he was worthy of death. Yet that Christ was innocent. That Christ was the Son of God. That he was not only just a righteous man, but he was the righteous of God. This man had done nothing amiss, he says, and he continues on in verse 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Amen. <laughs> <He> says, <clears throat> as far as we know, this was the only time the thief had been around Christ. I mean, he probably had heard of him, but he had heard the mockings, he had seen the superscription, and he had heard the prayer of Christ, but besides that we're not told of anything else that is mentioned to him we have two thieves here one of them mocks Christ and no doubt goes on into eternity condemned for his sin and yet the other one savingly believes on Christ if nothing else we see the sovereignty of God and salvation right. both had the same opportunities both had the same messages before them both had the same the same punishment upon them both were in the same exact situation yet one believes and one does not as you all know I've, I think I've preached a whole sermon on that as well so we won't spend too much time on it but his words to Christ is just simply remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom so certainly he knew that Christ had a coming kingdom. Just Lord remember me. Not It wasn't as the disciples said, you know, let me sit on your right hand and they're on the left hand. No, just remember me was the only thing he asked. I don't know. The disciples apparently didn't understand what they were asking for when they said that. Christ himself said it wasn't his to give. Here, the, the thief doesn't ask for notoriety just to be remembered when Christ came in his kingdom. 1 Corinthians 12 3 says that no man can call Jesus Lord without the Holy Spirit. And here he calls him Lord. Lord, remember me. And no doubt, in aligning himself with Christ was not to put himself in popularity with the Jews at this point. He was in line and you know, professing Christ to be king. He was basically condemning the Jews all at the same time. Well, no, the thief wasn't going to win a popularity contest after this. You know, oftentimes it's the same when the Lord saves us. We're not going to be necessarily popular after the Lord saves us. Not with the world, at least. 
Jesus answers him in verse 43 and says, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And here's the promise of Christ to him. You know, today, not years from now, not when I, not at the rapture or at the second coming or whatever you want to call it. Do it not, you know, not when the trumpet sounds. No, today he says, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. You know, the thief would be with his Lord and Savior that very day. He wouldn't be going to purgatory and, you know, hoping he right. made his way out. Right. It's my view that, based on the other scriptures, that Christ went into a place called Hades, and he preached the gospel there, preached deliverance unto the captives, is what I believe it's Peter says. No, no doubt to the Abraham and the other saints there, you it was to their quote unquote salvation and to the those in hell and the rich man the others there it was to their condemnation but oh the thief was with them there that very day not later on but as soon as he closed his eyes he would be with his savior and so it is with us today that you either close your eyes and open them in hell as the rich man did or you or you find yourself in the presence of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There is no al alternative. I mentioned that I had sp spoke with a Mormon man here recently, and he he was uh, advocating for second chances after death. Well, I told him I, I'm sure everyone in hell wished they had a second chance to repent. Well, he said, well, what about those who... Uh, Basically, he said, what about those who don't have the opportunity to hear the gospel? And I told him, well, God is able to make whom he will a vessel of wrath and whom he will a vessel of mercy. He hasn't talked to me since then. <laughs> you know, there's no second chances once you close your eyes in death. Okay, we won't ride that point. We'll go on to the verse 44 here. You know, we were says, and it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. So for three hours there was darkness. This is where Christ cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And verse 45 says, And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. As we know when Christ cried out with a loud voice, the temple was, or the veil of the temple was rent, as the Matthew and Mark say, from top to bottom, that as if God himself had torn it in two. Verse 46 says, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. And this does appear to be the second cry recorded in Matthew and Mark, but they don't record what his words were. It's hard to tell for sure if this was before or after when he says it is finished, but I think it's afterwards. Because in here he says, I commend my spirit, and he gives up the ghost. You know, the body might die, but the spirit continues on. You know, there are some who don't separate the difference between the spirit and the soul, but I think Paul very plainly says that he did desire that your whole body, spirit, and soul be preserved. Whatever your view is, though, the, the spirit and the soul will continue on, even when the body expires but here he says father into thy hands I commend my spirit it was a, quite a change here wasn't it just a little while ago he cried out my God my God why hast thou forsaken me you know as I pointed out God the father had to turn his back to, so to speak to Christ when he became sin for us but here the sacrifice had been completed, and he says, My Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Well, no greater comfort is there than to commend our spirit to God, is there? Amen. Just as Stephen did in Acts 7.59, and he, there he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You know, these words of Christ seem to echo the words of Psalm 31.5. We won't turn there, but... They say, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Just the same. 
no, and then he goes on. He goes on to say, and having said thus, he gave up the ghost. He willingly gave up his life. You know, it wasn't that it was taken from him. It wasn't that you know, they had defeated Christ, but yet, when the work had been accomplished, he gave up the ghost. He gave up his life. It's also fitting, I think. The first recorded words we have of Christ are, I must be about my Father's business. In the last words of Christ, at least in his er fleshly life, his Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He had been totally committed to the Father from beginning to end. Which really shows us the fulfillment of the burnt sacrifice when all was given to God. Verse 47 says, Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Now, he was a righteous man, but he was more than that, wasn't he? You know, he was an innocent from the charges that were pronounced against him. He was completely, perfectly righteous. But he was much more than just simply a righteous man. Lot was described as a righteous man. Uh, I think Noah and Job as well. But oh, Christ was so much more than just a righteous man. He was the very Son of God. The very Christ, Messiah, Savior of the world. Verse 48 says, And all the people that came together to that site beheld, or beholding the things which were done, smote their breast and returned. All these people around, they had, they beheld what took place. You know, it's like the publican in Luke 18, they smote upon their breast. It says, and then they returned back home. And they kept on going about their way. Verse 49 says, and all his acquaintances, acquaintances, and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off, beholding these things. You know, Christ had been completely forsaken by all. Even his followers, even his closest of friends were standing afar off. Do we stand afar off from Christ or are we close by him? I'd say many professing Christians today are at the very least standing afar off. Perhaps some of them seem to be in a completely different country. Go on to verse 50 here. Uh, we'll Conclude with the burial of Christ's body. Behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. And here we see Joseph of Arimathea once again. Verse 51 says, The same had not consented to the counsel indeed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. Uh, Mark calls him an honorable counselor. As I pointed out, Arimathea is the Greek word for Ramal, which is was a city of the Jews. If you remember, I asked how Joseph was alluded to before this. Does anyone find out what I was referring to? The hint is in verse 51. It says, The same had not consented to the council indeed of them. So it appears that he was a member of the council. This counselor here is said to be a member of the Sanhedrin. But yet, being a good man, a just man, being himself described as a disciple of Christ, it says he didn't consent to the council indeed of them. So he didn't agree to their rulings, if you will. Once again, the, the mob rule is what won out in the case of Christ. This man, he went and begged the body of Jesus. Verse 52 says, This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone where never man before was laid. This uh, linen would be observed by Peter to be laying next to an empty tomb just a few verses later in Luke 24, 12. He was laid in a in a new tomb, as the other gospels say, a tomb that had not been used before. 
but we do know he was buried with the rich in his death. He was buried among the rich. He was buried among the wicked. But yet, well, he was buried in this new tomb that they couldn't say, well, it wasn't his body there. Yeah, uh, Matthew, I think it is, calls him a rich man. That's why that fulfills Isaiah's requirement or prophecy. There you go. That in his death he would be with the rich. He would make his grave with the wicked. Verse 54 says, And that day was a preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. There's a lot of debate about what the Sabbath was. But it, I can't find three days and three nights between Friday evening and Sunday morning. Right. And Christ did say he was to be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, Matthew 12, 40. <laughs> Verse 55 says, And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher, and how his body was laid. And they returned to prepare spices and ointments, and rested the Sabbath day according to commandment. So the women came. They saw that he was laid there. You know, they would return three days later and find that he wasn't there anymore. But still being obedient Jews, they rested on the Sabbath day. It says they prepared spices and ointments. As we'll see next week in John, he tells us these were given by Nicodemus. Well, I had intended to look at some verses in Acts, but I decided to save them for later. Lord willing, we'll look at them in our last lesson because they seem to summarize what we've been looking at and kind of drive uh, my last point home for the, this class. So Lord willing, next week we'll look at the sacrifice of Christ according to John, uh, which is most of John chapter 18 and all of John chapter 19. And I'd like to look at at least one or two verses from First John. So our homework for the night is to find the word propitiation and tell how it applies to Christ. Have any questions or comments before we close?